Good morning and welcome to worship this morning at First Presbyterian Church in Denison and Grand Avenue Presbyterian Church in Sherman. So good to have you with us today. Friends, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us worship God. Good morning. Please join me in our call to worship. The psalmist sings, One thing I ask of the Lord, that I will seek after to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in God's temple. God is good and in love and mercy greets us here. our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? With humble hearts, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Merciful, Merciful God, God, you have you made, made us citizens, citizens of heaven, but we, we confess, confess that, that we, we have set our minds on earthly things. things. We, we have let our desire for security restrain our commitment to serve the poor. We have we let our fear of danger curb our obligation to love our enemies. We have let our love of things dull, our generosity to the needy. We have let our craving for public status prevent our honesty about hidden sins. Yet you know the desires of our heart and nothing is hidden from you. 
by the power of the Holy Spirit, conform our sin-weakened bodies to the glory of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ for the world. Amen. Join me in saying, in his name we pray. Amen. God, our light and our salvation, does not forsake us or leave us with our sin. In Christ we are forgiven and offered the gift of healing repentance. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. lesson today is Genesis, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 12. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Ab Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Elazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and, there, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. No one but your own very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. He said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans <clears throat> to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, and a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But did he did not cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. Our gospel reading for the morning comes to us from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. Hear now this word of God. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Give my Lord to serve the Lord. I give my 
What do you do when you are confronted by bad things? When it seems like there may be evil influences around? How do you respond? What do you do? Pray. Pray, yes? Good. So turning to faith and uh, turning to reliance upon God, offering prayer. There's some other things that you might do as you maybe feel confronted sometimes by evil influences or, or bad things coming at you? Hi. You what? Hi. Run away. Run away. Ah, yeah. Avoid sure. Yeah. <laughs> Avoid it or go into combat mode. Sure. Those are, those are good things. Fight or flight. Um, yes, you, you want to back away and, and maybe not have the confrontation. That would be a good thing. And if you ultimately have to uh, stand up to it, then, then you fight, you go into combat. There are certainly situations on the world stage where those kinds of things are happening, and many people, many nations, many leaders are confronted with having to make a response. And so I'm sure there are lots of people who are perplexed by that and who are wondering about what the right thing is to do, and they're trying different things maybe all of the things that we've mentioned. When we come to this passage in Luke, here's Jesus roughly in the middle of the travel narrative as he has left the, the mountain of transfiguration, turned his face toward Jerusalem, and Luke gives us 10 chapters of Jesus making his way toward Jerusalem. So this comes roughly at the halfway point of the travel narrative where Luke has expounded upon all of the things that have happened as Jesus made his way to Jerusalem. And here's an interesting thing that happens. We often think of the Pharisees or the Pharisees and the scribes as being uh, people who didn't like Jesus, who rejected Jesus, who were not in favor of him, who were suspicious of him. Here in, in this 13th chapter, the first thing that happens, the Pharisees are warning Jesus. They know that he's on his way to Jerusalem, and they're coming to him and saying, Jesus, don't go there. Don't go to that place. Herod, you know all about Herod. Herod wants to kill you. The Pharisees were trying to warn him, trying to save his life. 
In Luke, we get this more complicated relationship between Jesus and the Pharisees, where the Pharisees and he are engaging in things, where he several times sits down and has dinner with them. He also sits down and has table fellowship with lots of other people, many of whom would have been rejected by the Pharisees and, and the scribes, the, uh, the religious people. He sits down and has table fellowship with them. He, he obviously has some kind of relationship with the Pharisees here in Luke where they want to care for him. They offer him this warning. And what does Jesus do? Jesus, knowing all about Herod, knowing what Herod has done to his cousin John, beheading him on a whim because that was what his new wife wanted. He knew that Herod could do cruel things. He knew that if Herod was after his life, Herod could very well take it. Jesus calls Herod an old fox. You know about foxes and hens, right? Foxes and chickens. I was having a conversation with a fellow yesterday. He said, oh, I, I used to have chickens. I don't have chickens anymore. Um, he said, uh, we live out in the country, and there are just too many things that come after chickens. He said, my brother tried it once. He started out with 109 chickens. He finished up with about 29 chickens because of all of the things that came after the chickens. He said, I started out with 20 chickens, and I ended up with none. Because there are things like coyotes and bobcats and snakes and other things that will come after chickens, hawks and other birds of prey, all kinds of things. You find them an easy, juicy meal. Herod would just as well have consumed Jesus like a fox after easy prey. He'd already done that to John. Jesus, after calling Herod a fox and telling the people who told him, the Pharisees, to go back to that old fox and tell him, here's what I'm doing. I'm curing people. I'm proclaiming good news. I'm doing what is right in the eyes of God. That, in essence, was Jesus' mission statement. This is what I'm about. Go tell that old fox, this is what I'm doing. It was a way of saying, he's not going to be deterred. He's going to Jerusalem, to the very place where Herod lives. I don't know whether Jesus intended to confront Herod or to think that he would overthrow the Roman Empire. But Jesus was not going to be deterred from doing the good. And so he gave that message to the Pharisees to take to Herod. He was on his way to Jerusalem where those things would happen. And he spoke about doing things on the first day and the second day and completing it on the third day. Probably a kind of foreshadowing or a little hint to say, this is what will happen on the third day. A little foreshadowing to say, Herod may indeed do me in, but he won't finish me. The third day, something else will happen. And Jesus does this interesting thing. He offers a lament. When you think of lament, what comes to mind? Anything? Lament is a kind of complaint or an expression of sorrow. We lament those who have died. We offer our lament for a sense of defeat. We offer laments for different things where there's maybe bad news that has come. In the biblical tradition, oftentimes the prophets would offer laments and as often as not, the lament would be for a city like Jerusalem 
or for people like all of Israel. But the lament would be for the people because they had begun to be unfaithful. They were not living up to what God would have them do. They were not doing the things that God would set before them, before him. They, they were not following in the way that God wanted them to follow. And so the prophets would offer a lament, and that lament would be a part of challenging the people to try to have them turn around and go in a different direction to, in a sense, begin repentance. A lament, a lament for the city. Jesus offers a lament. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he says the city that kills the prophets. Jesus' lament, though, is different from the traditional lament of the prophets, where the prophets are concerned about the unfaithfulness of the city. Jesus offers a lament that is for the people and for his care for them. Jesus wants to offer his care and his love for all of the people. He wants to bring them together and show them the love of God. It, in a sense, reverses the lament that the prophets offer. It's, it's not just a call to faithfulness, but a call to have them know how much God loves them. All of them. Every last one of them. That's who Jesus is concerned about. All of the people. And his lament is to begin having them know that God loves them deeply and dearly and for all of time. And then Jesus does an interesting thing. Jesus offers an image of God as a hen, as a hen caring for her brood. Have you ever seen uh, a chicken caring for its chicks? Where maybe they're getting ready to roost at night and, and she will call them in, gather them together, and she'll, she'll stretch her wings out and, and, and bring her chicks together under her wings and offer them warmth and protection. Or if maybe they're out in the yard or some other place and she happens to see a threat, she'll gather them together. She'll offer protection to them. It's what a mother would do. And, and here's Jesus giving us an image of God that is very much feminine. It's a feminine image of God offering protection to the people. Richard Rohrer says, it must be that Jesus had a very positive relationship with a woman, likely his mother, to use an image like that of of God, of understanding God in that way as feminine, like a mother hen caring for her chicks. The story that some of you may have heard me share before is one that I ran across some time ago. It's a firefighter who was together with a, a bunch of other uh, firefighters uh, trying to contain a blaze that had come up to a farmhouse. They had worked and worked to try to, point it, uh, to, try to put it out and had done their best, but it had overtaken uh, a good part of the farm. After the blaze had died down and it was just smoking embers, one of the firefighters was walking around checking things and he looked down on the ground and he saw what he was sure was a chicken it was all burned up, it was smoky, the, the feathers were all black, but he was kind of taken aback by it because he saw it moving, making these strange motions. And he knew the chicken wasn't alive, but, but here it was moving. He went over and, and kicked it a little with his foot the dead body of this hen fell over as he kicked it, and 
beneath her body were all of her little chicks. She knew the smoke was coming. She knew the flames were about. She gathered her chicks together. She brought them in under her wings. She sat on top of her, chicken, of her chicks. And by sacrificing her life, she saved their lives. Jesus goes toward Jerusalem. He knows what will happen in that city, the city that kills prophets. He has a pretty good idea about the outcome with Herod. Jesus chooses to go. He doesn't choose safety. He doesn't run away when he could have avoided it. He'd been warned. It's not as though he expected to do battle with Herod and somehow come on top, come out on top. He saw that going to Jerusalem was the way that he would bring about good, the way that he would offer protection, the way that he would communicate God's compassion to all of the people by going there, confronting the evil influences, confronting all of the ways in which evil says, I will have the last word, I will have the day. And Jesus showed to them, evil does not have the last word. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Three days later, he rose from the dead to proclaim the good, to proclaim the love of God, to proclaim the way in which God loves and cares for all of us and offers our protection, just as that mother hen did. Jesus would send us into the world, sometimes to make sacrifices, sometimes to confront evil, sometimes not always to choose safety, but to choose the good. That's what we're called to do as God's disciples, just as Jesus called his disciples to come and follow him all the way to Jerusalem. Friends, let us stand and say together what we believe. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal.
to honor Bob Cooper as we remember him and as his family has gathered here in part to make their own contribution to, uh, to Bob's memory. So I'd like to invite his daughter, Carol Lee, to come forward and to share some thoughts with you. In addition to being that at the people of the sons that are sitting in death, they all call the country soon. For those of you who might have, we would like to agree that he's a quiet and strong individual. He was not able to share him, but he was very passionate about protecting his life. He's a good service to his country, photography, and fiction. Dad spent two years back to the Union Army, serving in Korea and then 23 years in the Guard and Reserves. And they say this was incredible, and maybe he was just crazy, but Dad was really well in the army. In addition to his military service, Dad had a career in photography. And this is where my dad really shone. He worked in the fields of education, medicine, commercial, and military photography. However, he passed his mind, and I had a lot of vacation. He shared his love of fishing with my brothers and I, starting when we were very, very young. Dad would take us to fish for the field. Using some old damn poems that are very much on the way in terms of common life. I can see you, my brother, cries at the sight of me when they caught a fish. I still laugh when I remember my dad trying to keep my brother Jack from falling into a pond. Simultaneously, we were trying to catch the fishing pole with the fish that my brother was swinging around and around because he was so excited. Dad and my brothers fished together off and on for years. They became quite accomplished anglers, with my brother Jeff literally living the life of a fisherman, which was a tremendous gift for my father to share. While the fishing team wasn't something that I needed, I did share my dad's passion for photography, as did my brother's Robbie and Craig. I also shared dad's commitment to service. I spent my entire career swimming in the federal government, reporting service for the beginning, and working in over 48 countries around the world. One of my favorite memories of my dad is when he bought me my first digital camera prior to my departure from Afghanistan. And this was huge for my dad. He didn't like the little camera, so he did not think he could take it home with us. He just, he was very, very old school. However, he bought the camera. He spent a beautiful all day in and around the school of Washington, where they lived at the time, learning how to use my camera. While I couldn't search for it, took me all over the world. I would always send him back pictures of places that I had been to. On my trips home, he and I would often sit together and look at the over 22,000 plus photos I had on When my dad was not a photographer, and with dementia slowly taking the rest of his speech, as my new book had last July, he suddenly turned to me and said, Hey, take my picture. This photo you see here is one of the last pictures, possibly my favorite, of my dad. Well, we did always get to spend a great deal of time together. I'm very grateful that I was able to spend the last three months caring for him, spending quality time with my dad. The last passion I would like to mention about my dad was that there is love to his life. He loved you so much. He made his, he was quite 38 years from my dad, but he made him very, very careful. He's going to love him quite cute. Well, love and care, at least for these last few years, to give to my dad, especially when he's doing things. Love him quite careful. Well, I've already had shared many wonderful adventures over the years, including traveling, 
many, many hours to a lot of fishing and boating in Washington State, Canada, and Texas. Dad Bonnie became the visiting Panama on our station there. And I still see Dad on Christmas Day insisting that we drive over to Panama Canal so we can take pictures. The appeal and the engineering of the Panama Canal is so exciting to him. And um, it, it was very tough to pull him away from the Christmas festivities. So while Dad was off taking pictures of the day, Bonnie and I were home cooking Christmas dinner. At one point, I think Bonnie and I were just ready to toss my dad into the camp and lose the cow. After retiring, dad took a volunteer at the Museum of Eastwood and later here at the Perry Military Museum. He created displays and photographed museum artifacts, creating digital records. It is great to know that some of his work may be gone for many years to come. In closing, the final gift I inherited from my dad was a strong work ethic. His drive and his determination. I can't imagine a better gift for a parent to bestow to on their children. But unfortunately, I also inherited Dad's sweet tooth and a bit of his cleverness as well. I guess you can't move on. And while my brothers are not here to defend themselves, I will say that they too are inherited my father's stubborn streak. Twofold. So, on behalf of my brothers and myself, thank you, Dad, for your passion, for your gifts. They are doing for you which help to shape the people we became. Love you, Dad. Appreciate sure. it. Bob didn't want to make a fuss. He was the kind of guy who didn't especially want attention brought to himself, which is why we're doing this today as a part of the service rather than a separate service just for Bob. I think he probably didn't want people to go out of their way. Too much trouble. Too big a deal, he might have said. Taking just a few minutes to honor someone who has lived a long and fruitful life, served his country well, raised four children, saw the joy of marrying again, then known the blessings of grandchildren is not a fuss. It is being able to take time out to offer our thanks to God for all that has come through him. Bob was a good and decent man. He was accustomed to orderliness and the discipline he learned in military life. He appreciated seeing others exercise discipline in their lives too, even though Carol Lee pointed out we all rebelled against his army discipline at one point or another. To exercise discipline is to be engaged in the practice of following a regimen, being a follower of someone or something. It is close to what it means to be a disciple, just as Jesus called people into discipleship. In the biblical text, discipleship and service go hand in hand. For Bob, the sense of discipline and service to his country went hand in hand. As with many people in the military, the friendships they formed while serving were strong connections, even if it wasn't possible to stay connected after their time of service. There's something about meeting with other people who have had similar experiences and know similar bonds of friendship that saw them through those times that is like nothing else. Shortly before the end of Jesus' life, he said this, as John the Evangelist tells us in his gospel, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. Jesus called his disciples friends and spoke about laying down his life for them. While Jesus was talking about something different from the military, the experience of serving together and being willing to die for one another as people are to do in the military, may be one of the closer experiences one can have to Jesus' expectation that we are to give sacrificially for one another as a disciple 
as a follower, a friend of Jesus. Bob didn't spend all of his life in the military. After completing his work in the U.S. Army, he became a photographer, working as an industrial photographer in forensics and in the medical field, among others. Bob was teaching photography in Dallas while working at the medical school. There was a group of medical illustrators doing some training there, and Bob noticed they were having trouble getting their illustrations completed while the surgeries were taking place. So Bob put together a program to teach them some photographic methods that would help with their illustrations. Catherine said he was a very good teacher at UT Health Science Center. He had very high expectations, and if you met those expectations, he was satisfied. He taught them about cutting mats for their work, editing and critiquing. Bob was down to earth and approachable. He kept in touch with his students, especially since there may have been only five to a class at a time. That may be why Catherine invited Bob to a party she threw with her classmates and a few other people. It happened to be that her sister-in-law was in town for this particular party. Bob and Barbara met there and quickly discovered they both drove 240Zs. Even though Bob's was standard and Barbara's had been modified because she raced hers. They were both involved in teaching and they both loved boating and fishing. It was just that Barbara was living and teaching in Tucson, Arizona and Bob was living and teaching in Dallas, Texas. I suppose it must have been something akin to love at first sight. Barbara told me that Bob proposed to her on their very first date. She was a little taken aback on that date in March, but they managed a long distance relationship, seeing each other once a month or so. Bob didn't have a ring for her, but gave her pearls when she finally agreed in July. Maybe it was that Barbara was a pearl to Bob. Bob and Barbara moved to Squim on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. They had a 24-foot cuddy cabin inboard outboard boat with a two-burner stove, an icebox, and a bed. She said it was something like a tent on the water. They caught lots of fish with that boat, which was dubbed Barbara Sue, named for her, and spent enough time on it to claim it as a second residence. On one of their early trips on the Barbara Sioux, they got into some high winds and rough whitecaps on the way back. A friend, Barbara, said that it was a white knuckle trip for three hours. A friend saw the anxiety on her face after she got back to the dock. He asked how she was, and then he told her, your boat isn't going to sink. You have to have confidence in your boat and confidence in your captain. Had she not heard that word, she says she would likely have sold the boat and never gone out on one again. Barbara found that she did have confidence in their boat and she had confidence in Bob. And that made the difference. When it came time to sell the Barbara Sue after 18 years, Barbara had to be away from the house when the new owners came to take it away. Bob's daughter, Carolee, worked for the Department of Defense, being stationed in 48 countries during her career. She pointed out that the only place Bob ever visited while she was out of the country was Panama. She might have had something, that might have had something to do with boats. He loved getting a tour of the locks, getting to go behind the fence, to see some of the facilities that few other people get to see. And he and Barbara got to go on a tour in a boat so small compared to the ships that were passing through the canal that it seemed like they would be swamped just by their wake. Bob and Barbara moved to Denison to be closer to Bob's sons. Bob had taught his sons to fish when they were very young. The boys had a way of finding fishing holes that no one thought were any good. At least once, they were stopped and questioned by the police when they went to a small creek behind some houses with their rods and reels. The officers almost didn't believe them until they showed them their catch. It was Jeff who really caught the fishing bug. Jeff took Bob on a fishing trip to Canada, which Bob really loved. 
Evelyn Bryant recalled how Bob de was devoted to Barbara. David said his favorite memory of Bob was when the four of them hired a guide to go striper fishing. When David wrote me this note though, autocorrect did its funny thing and so what he actually wrote to me was that they'd hired a guide to go stripper fishing. I asked if he wanted me to, to let you all know that or to clarify what kind of fish it might be. He thought striper might be better. They got out on the lake to a spot where it looked like they were biting. They spread out several feet apart with Bob up at the front of the boat. Bob, he said, caught the first fish and the second fish and the third fish all the way up to about the 10th fish before anybody else on the boat caught fish. But by the end of the trip, Bob, with a smile on his face, had caught at least half of the fish for that day. There are times when life can give us gemstones more precious than pearls. There are also times when hardships come that can leave us feeling like we've been swallowed up by life itself. Losing a child is one of the hardest blows anyone can have. Bob lost his first son, Ravi, to addiction 21 years ago. Easter weekend. Their move here to be closer to the boys seemed all too short. Jeffrey died of a brain tumor six years after they arrived. Craig died a year ago this month, also of a brain tumor. What things are there to see us through such heartbreak but resilience, a loving spouse, a caring daughter, and the compassionate love of God. A pearl, as you probably know, is formed when a foreign object gets inside the shell of a mollusk that it can't get rid of. It potentially could be life-threatening to it. Over time, the mollusk forms layers and layers of nacre to coat the irritant. What threatened the oyster or the clam doesn't go away. It's covered in something that begins to have an iridescent beauty. It may be that one of the most valuable pearls God had to share with Barbara, with Carolee, and with his grandsons, Lane, Camera, and Riley, was his resilience, his ability to accept what would seem unacceptable to any of us, to live through it and to pass that gift on to the people he loved, even as we might know it as a pearl of great price. Bob also had the loving assurance of Barbara by his side as he was confronted by such loss. When the end of Bob's life came near, as it does for each of us, he had the blessing of Barbara and Carol Lee on either side of him as Barbara gently reminded him of the words we would say only a few days later on Ash Wednesday. We are dust, and to dust we shall return. In life and in death, we belong to God. It is the affirmation that God, whom we know to be the God of compassion, claims us in all of life, and for all of time. Let us pray. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Robert Alfred Cooper. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own flock, a lamb of your own belonging, a sinner of your own redeeming, Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints of light. Amen. Ensure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God our brother Robert, Robert Alfred Cooper, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, 
Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, says the Spirit. They rest from their labors. Their works follow them. In honor of Bob's life, I would like to share with you something that his grandson Riley had to offer. Since we were not able to have a musician here this morning to play taps, it is Riley, his grandson, who recorded this for us and has it for us to share today. Friends, let us join together in a word of prayer for those persons in our concerns. Let us pray. God, we come to you in thanksgiving for all of the ways that you call us to go about living and doing the good that you would call us to do. We offer you now our prayers for those whom we know to be in need. For Christine, as she is in a difficult recovery. We pray that the tests that she has been undergoing will provide good information for her as she and her doctors seek new kinds of treatment. We pray that she would know a good sense of relief from the pain that she is experiencing. May your blessings of comfort be with her. For Cherry and for Sally, as they continue treatments for cancer, we pray for their well-being, for the ways in which they have entrusted themselves and their lives to those who are caring for them. We pray that they would know your healing ways, that your healing ways might be at work in them. We pray, too, for those who are in service to our nation and to the world, who find themselves in a dangerous and hostile environment, for those who are doing their very best to offer security, protection, and hope for people in far-off places. We pray especially for those who are in Ukraine, those who are trying to save their lives and the lives of their loved ones, for those who have hopes to save their country and what it means for them to be independent. We pray that they may be a part of resisting evil, resisting those who would do them harm. We pray that there might be a new vision in the world of what it means for us to be together as nations and peoples. We pray that there would be a newfound sense of respect and care for one another. We come to you in thanks for the life of Bob Cooper for the ways that he risked his life and gave of himself as a part of the military. We offer our thanks for his service. We offer our remembrances and our honor for his good life, for the ways in which he was able to live for 90 plus years 
May your blessings be with those who loved him and to still cherish him as they remember and give thanks for his life. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Friends, now let us give to God the Lord's tithes and our offerings. Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. Lord our God, we come to you in thanksgiving for all of the ways that you call us together to be your faithful people, for the ways in which you give us these opportunities to offer ourselves and our gifts to you. We pray that you would take us and use us in proclaiming your good news throughout all of your creation. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord, who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Maker, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and in every moment of your living. The Lord be with us. The Lord be with us all. Thank you. 